If you don't have a lot of familiarity with working with contracts, the idea of negotiating or signing a contract may provoke a little bit of nervousness. And that's not that crazy. Contracts are important and they can have important effects on your business relationships. So in this video, we're going to kind of lay out some contract basics and give you some advice on negotiating and signing contracts in the game development business. Let's get started. So welcome, this is Thousand Ant, where we talk about game development, business, and making a living in the games industry. I'm Matt Shell, and in this video, we're gonna talk about contracts and try to raise your confidence level when dealing with them. I got to thinking about this video when I saw a recent Twitter thread by an indie developer named Jake who's working on a game called Scrab Dackle. In the thread, which kind of blew up and got popular on game dev Twitter, he was talking about how he turned down what he saw as an exploitative contract from a game developer. I'll link to that thread in the description. There's a lot of interesting stuff in there. So I've worked with contracts in a bunch of different capacities, both in my distant history in the music business, then when I was working at Unity, and now in our technical marketing agency, Thousand Ant, where we do contracts with some of the biggest companies in the world who are our clients, and then also we do contracts with some of the contributors and collaborators that we work with as we bring projects to life, right? So we're dealing with individuals, we're dealing with big teams and departments, Importantly, I'm not a lawyer, right? But I do think that maybe I have a little more experience than the average indie game developer, right? So I wanted to, to share some of that. One of the things that I learned, and only kind of recently from my own lawyer, is what is the real good, valuable use of a contract, right? And, and what he shared with me and what I think is really, really useful to think about is the value of a contract is just to align expectations, right? It's just to get super duper clear about what are we actually doing here? When are we gonna do it? How much are we gonna pay for it? Who's involved? Who's gonna do what? And just put all that stuff in writing at the beginning of the process, right? Because as you may have experienced with your friends, family, and your normal life, we could have a conversation saying, you're gonna do this and I'm gonna do this, but we're both kind of hearing in our head all the things that we wanna hear, right? Oh, I just assume that you're gonna be the one who takes out the garbage because you always do it, right? Well, I'm sitting here thinking, oh no, no, you're, you're the one who's gonna do it, right? Because we haven't explicitly said, I'm gonna take out the garbage, you're gonna wash the dishes and establish those clear expectations, right? And that's really just what a contract is doing. It's just establishing really clear expectations between all the parties about who's gonna do what when, how much money, and so on. This is really a good thing. People get very nervous about contracts because they're worried they're gonna be kind of trapped into some kind of bad deal, and it is possible that those things can happen, right? But it's more important just to say, hey, we're just gonna really take some time here at the outset to just make a really clear agreement about everything that's going on and all the details, and what that's gonna do is protect the relationship, right? And if you do business, you know that the absolute most important valuable thing you have is your relationships with the people you work with, with your clients, with your suppliers, right? Whoever it is, that relationship is the thing that keeps a business running smoothly and the thing that really needs to be protected. And having a clear understanding and expectations means that nobody's gonna get mad when something doesn't happen or does happen that they weren't expecting. Now, the second use of a contract, and this is honestly way, way less often than most people would think, is in the case of legal action. A legal action situation where somebody's either suing or something like that is happening is just a total failure of all, everything has failed, right, when we get to that point. Communication is broken down, the relationship is broken down, all of our good efforts to salvage things have broken down, but of course it does happen. What a contract does in that situation is we just have really clear written terms. I agreed to do this, you agreed to do this, in the event that something changes or something goes wrong or we need to terminate the relationship or whatever, here's what's gonna happen, right? So for example, we're doing a job together and I say, hey, I'm hiring you to do this, but if we get halfway through and 
you know, I just decide, hey, the work that you're delivering, it just really isn't the right fit for the project. We need to stop working together without delivering the full project. Well, then there should be some clear language in the contract. You know, do you get paid for the first half? Do you get to keep the money that you got so far? Or, you know, I mean, usually that's what's going to happen, right? That's why you charge half up front. That'll just be spelled out, right? So there's no hard feelings. We say, okay, yeah, we're going to pay you out what we agreed. And we're going to, you know, there might be some hard feelings if you're cutting off in the middle, right? But basically we say it's really clear what we've agreed to do in the case when this and this happens, you know, okay, it's clear. And, and often, you know, we'll have situations where we're getting into a situation and, oh, what are our responsibilities here? The, the project is going a little bit sideways and maybe it's not totally clear what the next step is. And then we can look at the contract and say, ah, yes, okay, we agreed. If now we suddenly need to go back to square one, well, we're going to charge an additional fee or whatever it is, right? And that's already there in writing and has been signed by both parties so that when we come back and say, hey, uh, you know, we agreed to this. You guys are going to need to pay more. They can say, well, yeah, okay, we did, we did in fact agree to that, right? And maybe they'll say, hey, we don't want to do that or whatever, and then you can talk. But the contract provides this basis for what happened, right? And in that ultimate failure state where we're going into a court of law, well, then the judge or whoever it is can look at the contract and say, well, you did say you were going to pay half up front, or you did say that in the event where we decided to part ways, each person had these rights or, or whatever the case may be, right? So it just lays a basis to resolve differences and conflicts. One, because you've gotten clear about what it is. And two, in the case where there's some kind of breakdown of the relationship and communication and everything else, well, you have it in writing that this is what we're going to do if we decide to, you know, not complete the project or whatever it is. So that's what contracts are for, right? Now, how do we actually deal with them? The first and really most important thing is get a lawyer. If you are at the point in your business where you're starting to sign contracts and you're starting to agree to do work that is going to be connected to money and maybe somebody's going to make money or lose money, just spend the money on the lawyer. Maybe a couple hundred dollars, or maybe a couple thousand dollars, right? Depending on the scale of the project, it's a really worthwhile expense. It may seem like, oh man, I don't even know if this project is going to go anywhere and do I really need to spend this money? First of all, that's a good moment to say, hey, if I'm not willing to invest the money in a lawyer, should I really be investing weeks of my time or months of my time into something that's not clear and I don't know I want to put money into? It's also a good little kind of sanity check there. We're like, okay, we're going to start this thing. We're going to spend some money on the lawyer. Should we really be doing this? Now, ideally, your lawyer should be someone who has experience in your industry. Now, if you're not super well connected or you don't have a big network, you should have one and you should build one, but it may be hard to find somebody with industry specific experience. And if that's the case, try to find someone with adjacent experience, right? For example, if you can't find a lawyer who specializes in games, people who specialize in film or other creative industries deal with a lot of the same problems, right? Licensing, intellectual property, and so on, right? So find someone that at least understands broadly the industry that you're in, in this case, we're talking about games, right? That's going to be super valuable because they are going to be able to look at any agreements either that you're creating or that are coming in for you to review and sign and say, yeah, the things that they're asking for here or the things that we're asking for are reasonable, are normal things for people to ask for. I've seen this in a lot of contracts. A lot of people do this, even if maybe we don't totally like it or are thrilled about it, it's it's normal and within reason. If you have someone who has no experience or context, they won't have that industry specific knowledge to be like, yeah, it's pretty normal for people to ask for these kind of rights in this kind of project. Or no, 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 you see here what they're trying to do. This is really not normal and not fair. And we, we should push back on this and not agree. If you can't find a specialist lawyer yourself and you have some relationship to a non-specialist lawyer, ask them and they can say, yeah, I know so-and-so who does good work. And ideally, this should be a long-term relationship, right? If you find a lawyer that you like working with, they can be really, really valuable in terms of giving you advice in your business and helping you avoid some of the kind of legal issues or pitfalls that you may be encountering right over the long term. So as a kind of member of your team, having a good lawyer is really, really valuable and worth spending money on, in my opinion. So let's say we get to the situation where we're about to enter into a negotiation that could lead to a contract, right? One of the really common 
first steps is going to be to sign a mutual NDA or non-disclosure agreement. These are the kind of things that probably once you understand them, you don't need to run by your lawyer every single time, right? That they're kind of formulaic and if you've seen a couple of them, you kind of know what they look like and, and you can start to spot like, whoa, why are they asking for this in the NDA, right? But it's a little bit of a formality, right? What I would recommend is if you get your first NDA and there are things in it that you don't understand, review it with your lawyer, get them to kind of explain it. But then in the future, once you're kind of familiar with signing NDAs, you can kind of look at one and be like, yeah, it looks fine and just sign, right? It's a, it's a thing that happens a lot. It's almost always the first step between two parties starting to negotiate because during the negotiation, you're going to share some confidential information, right? Or you may, or, you know, it may come up and they want to make sure that, Hey, you're not going to go blab to the competition or whatever it is. You've now agreed to basically keep their secrets, right? And they've agreed to keep your secrets as well. Now, once you've signed an NDA, there's usually going to be a process of meetings and emails and back and forth and talking and negotiating, right? And this is really where most of the deal is going to get made. You're going to talk about money. You're going to talk about timing. You're going to talk about who's involved, who has what, you know, roles to play and try to reach an agreement about the broad parameters of the deal and, and the stuff that's important. And then once you've kind of verbally agreed on a lot of that stuff and discussed it and negotiated it, then it'll be time to encode that in a contract and share it for legal review, right? So once you've said, yeah, we think it's gonna be this much money and this much time and these people involved and, and broadly these kind of rights and responsibilities, okay, now usually the bigger party, right? The bigger company uh, and usually the person who's about to be giving somebody else some money will draft the contract on their side, right? If you're negotiating with a publisher, they're gonna give you a contract. If we're hiring a freelancer, we're gonna give them a contract, right? So that's usually the way it goes. So, you know, you don't need to worry about having to draft contracts yourself unless you're hiring somebody else. And then this is the moment where you're gonna to wanna to take this to your lawyer, review it and share some feedback. Now, this is really the stage where having a lawyer who understands your industry is really important and valuable. Right now, you should read the contract, try to understand it as best you can, and anything that looks funny or unclear or, you know, that you're not comfortable with, you should make some notes of and bring them to discuss with your lawyer. Now, my advice is be organized about this because lawyers charge by the hour, right? So you don't want to spend <laughs> unnecessary time talking to your lawyer because they will charge you for it. And so once you have your questions, your lawyer has had a chance to read the contract, you should get on a call or whatever you want to a meeting and review the key terms, right? You can ask any questions that you have. What do you think of this? Is this normal for them to ask for this? Or I don't really feel comfortable committing to this schedule in the contract because it might change or whatever. Uh, what happens if it changes, etc. cetera. Uh, and your lawyer will also share some advice about what they think, you know, looks normal and fine and what might be like, hey, they're kind of trying it here. They're asking for a little too much. We might want to push back on this. And this is where that industry specific knowledge is really valuable, right? Because they can see, yeah, I've seen a few of these contracts and like, yeah, it's kind of normal to ask for this or mm, this is, they're kind of asking for a lot here. And, and that's where you can kind of then go back and make an informed revision to the contract. Now, the, the form that that usually will take is what's called a red line, right? And so a red line is just, we take your Microsoft Word document or whatever it is, and we go through and we just basically mark up, nope, we don't like this, or we wanna change this line to say this. And you're just basically making an edit of the contract, striking out provisions that you don't want, adding provisions that you do want, and then sharing that back with whoever gave you the first draft, right? So we're saying, yeah, we wanna take out this language about if we don't get done in 12 months, the contract is void, we want more flexibility on the schedule or whatever it is, strike that out, send it back. And then of course you can go back and forth. It's a continued negotiation, but hopefully most of the stuff has been kind of broadly negotiated already. And you've already talked about this stuff before you get to the stage of a contract. And that's kind of generally my advice in any of this stuff is try to hash it out as much as possible between the principles before you get the lawyers involved. Lawyers are expensive and you don't want to waste a lot of time and money negotiating the deal via the lawyers if you can avoid it. Now, this isn't actually a video about negotiation. It might be an interesting topic for another video. Drop a comment if you're interested in that as a subject. But the big picture here is that whoever has more leverage in the negotiation, meaning more ability to walk away, 
then they can kind of drive the terms of the negotiation, right? If this is a publisher who's offering you a deal, but you've already got your own money and you're like, yeah, maybe I want to work with a publisher because they would have some special help, but I don't need it. Then you're, you're in a great position. You've got leverage. You can walk away. You're like, you know what? I know that I can fund my game till the end of production. I don't need this money from you guys. I would like to work together, but it's not do or die for me. You're in a great position, right? And you can push back and say, no, no, no. This is the schedule I want. This is the money I want. If you don't like it, take it or leave it. Ideally, you want to avoid a situation where you're desperate and going into a negotiation, right? Because if they figure that out and they're not like a kind of a friendly operator, they may say, hey, these people are about to go bankrupt. We can ask for a lot out of them because they don't have a lot of other options, right? So you want to kind of either, if you don't have leverage, pretend that you do, but ideally have leverage going into the negotiation. And now this is kind of specific to indie game dev, right? But you may be in a situation or even in other industries where you're talking to somebody who you have a friendly relationship with, right? And you may be thinking, oh, bringing in the lawyers and doing a bunch of negotiation, that's not friendly. We're all cool, creative people who are all friends and so-and-so would never do anything unethical with me. Just put that thinking aside. When we move into the realm of business, contracts, and money, right, we're operating as professionals. This is not about our personal relationship. If I'm asking you to make a change to a contract or I'm negotiating somewhat aggressively in a contract negotiation, that's not because I hate you. It's because I'm doing my responsibility for myself and my team to make sure that we have the money to finish the game or whatever it is. Put aside the idea that you're not being friendly by negotiating or getting your lawyer involved or any of that, right? Just this is a professional situation and we all need to act as professionals. To be honest, if I am in a situation, even if it's with somebody that I know and they're not getting their lawyer involved, it actually lowers my confidence in the situation because I'm like, they didn't run this by a lawyer. Are they gonna come back six months later saying, hey, I didn't know what I agreed to. It goes back to that point about clarifying expectations. Really, you want everybody to have a lawyer, have read it, had it explained to them by a third party, right? I can explain it to you, but I'm your counterparty in this, right? So you should get a person who works for you to explain what they think the contract means, right? Not the counterparty who you're negotiating with. The other thing that having a lawyer in this kind of negotiation can really help with is you can kind of say, hey, I, I'm really friendly and cool. I want to make a deal, but my lawyer says I really need to change this. This is really not in my best interest. Ultimately, this is the thing that's important about the lawyer is your lawyer's job is to push for your best interest. Even when you yourself might be saying, no, 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 I know these people, they're cool. Whatever they put in the contract is probably cool. It's fine. I just really wanna make the deal and get started making my game, right? Your lawyer is gonna look at it and be like, hey, as your lawyer, I'm looking at this and even if these people are your friends, you shouldn't agree to it. You should go back to them and ask them to change it, right? And so it's just like having a kind of another person on your team trying to protect you, even in cases where you may not be thinking to protect yourself. Now, once you've gone through this process and you've revised and it's gotten to a point where we're like, yep, we've both made our changes. We think it looks good. Then it's just about signing. Nowadays, almost all contracts get signed electronically via something like DocuSign. They'll just email you a link. You log into the website, click to add your signature to each of the relevant fields. Make sure you save it, register for an account. This is, I actually don't like DocuSign this much, so it's not an ad for them, but make sure you save all your contracts, right? And keep, keep them in a safe place, please. Your signed copies for yourself, right? That you never know when you're gonna wanna look at them. That's it, right? It's really not that complicated of a process. It's an important process. That's why it's important to understand it, but it doesn't need to be a big nightmare. It's not, you know, the end of the world. And especially if you have a good lawyer to help you, it can be a pretty fluid and, you know, straightforward process. So if you have questions about contracts or this kind of area or these kind of process or suggestions for other topics that you'd like to cover in this style, please drop me a comment down below. I look forward to seeing those. Drop a like on the video for the YouTube algorithm. And if you're not already subscribed to the channel, please do. And as always, I just really appreciate your spending a little bit of time with me. And thanks so much for watching. I'll see you next time. Bye.